Welcome to the Apartment Operators Podcast, where you can learn from experienced operators what it really means to be an apartment operator. No fluff, no sugarcoating, just the raw, unfiltered truth of the ups and downs of operating multifamily communities. Welcome, everybody, to the Apartment Operators Podcast. My name is Joseph, and I'm your host. And today we have Stephen Weinstock. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So we start every episode with giving our guest a, a, a minute or two to introduce yourself. Tell us how you got into multifamily. What are you guys doing today? And we'll go from there. Sure. Stephen Weinstock. I live in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I started buying smaller assets in New Jersey, which is uh, my backyard, so to speak. Started there in 2000, all the way till about 2015. Just kept buying, self-managing, really just on my own throughout the process, investors here and there on specific deals. 2015, started buying some larger assets as well as out of town. Out of town for me means the Cleveland suburbs and Louisville, Kentucky. We self-manage those properties. I do have a partner at We Capital, Michael Eisner, that we're together every day in the office. But every deal has a different set of partners and different sets of strategies and the different workers. But we manage everything in-house. I travel uh, to these areas uh, pretty often and I'm boots on the ground and I get to see it with my own eyes. Oh, wow. So we're, we're going to have some fun on this conversation. You, not only you self-manage, but you also started before the previous cycle in 2001. So you've seen two, two full cycles now. So, so I'm sure there's a ton of insights in there. Let's start with the basic. How many units do you currently manage, own and manage? Uh, about 1,200. So 1,200 units. And oh, that must be painful in the self-management side of things. So why self-management? Why not third party? Good question. My answer today is different than my answer previous over the years. Today, most of the stuff we own is B class. Maybe some people say B minus. Some people might call it C. And I find those types of properties really work best self-managed. Third-party management is good for some properties. I find perhaps a third party is best on class A properties. Uh, but some of these value-add properties that we're buying and that we're involved in really needs our finger on the pulse throughout, whether it's to be nimble, pivot, change, price control, which is a major, especially on 70s vintage types of properties or 80s vintage, the self-manage really keeps us in line. I, I think the word you're, use, you're looking for and everybody we talk to is using is control. Control. Yeah, it, it, it's all about control. And, and no matter who we talk to, as soon as they reach a certain scale, that word keeps coming back into play. Correct, correct. So the days of me getting the phone calls about uh, actual everyone's heard this the toilet stuffed or uh, a leaky roof so those days for the most part stop i'm not getting personally those calls but i am hearing about it pretty fast whether it's in my email or in my management software and they were pretty aggressive and involved in taking care of that so at 1200 units how does your management structure look like i have an office here in brooklyn i have a partner uh, we both have different strengths He's more of the Excel and the management software and setting that up and making sure that works. He deals with mostly the accounts payable, the accounts receivable, all that. I personally am involved more with the on the ground employees that we have at the properties, the vendors as well, finding the vendors, finding the good workers, finding just everything that involves the actual management that the residents feel and touch. Gotcha. So who gets the 2 a.m. phone call with, we got a, uh, somebody drove into the building or we got a roof leak? So luckily for us, we're set up in a way where we do get that phone call, but at 2 a.m. we don't get it. I get to come to the office. I get to see it. Uh, I don't have to be there when the police arrive. When the code enforcement called me a few weeks ago about a water main break in one of our properties, I didn't have to be there, so to speak, but yeah, I was definitely involved. I was on the phone on a Sunday afternoon and I was seeking out the vendors, the leak detection companies, the water main guys to get this done ASAP. But the actual phone call at 2 a.m., I'll leave that to the politicians. Gotcha. So it does sound like you're still very much hands-on. So you said a minute ago that 
a few years ago, you would have a different answer to why self-management. Tell me a little bit about that. There's um, a story behind that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. My first purchase was 2001. It was a single family home in Trenton, New Jersey. It was $32,000. I was working a corporate job. Always knew I wanted to get into real estate. Used 10% down back then. Financing was a little easier, especially on smaller properties. I spent about three and a half grand out of pocket. And next thing I know, I was a landlord collecting $900 a month with an existing tenant that was there. So about, I would say about a year later, not on this property, but another one I, I bought a few months later, uh, I was in the housing court dealing with uh, a tenant uh, that wasn't paying and the tenant didn't show up. So I won by default and in the lobby or in the vestibule, there were some management uh, companies there and they reached out to me and uh, we tried, we discussed at, at the beginning, it was mostly money. Uh, I didn't want to spend the money. In hindsight, I'm very happy uh, because I got to learn really the property hands-on. I'm talking from putting in, putting classifieds in the print newspapers, doing the showings, weeding out people uh, over the phone. A lot of the tenants I took, even back then, when I was dealing with it, it wasn't necessarily their credit report. I wasn't renting to doctors and lawyers. I'm a people's person, and a lot of it was, I don't want to say a leap of faith, but it was talking to them, see how they communicate. I used to just ask them questions that were not necessarily relevant, but seeing how they respond was important. To the guy who wouldn't show up for a showing because he got pulled over or his car, a lot of that just tells me about them and I didn't uh, persist. When texting uh, became more common, a lot of it was done by text. But again, I would ask them lots of questions. I would see what kind of questions they ask me. So I really got a lot of hands-on experience. Fast forward to about 09, 10, I did hire this guy who came recommended. He was a good guy to manage some of my portfolio that I had uh, in, I guess, central New Jersey, the area, Red Bank, off the Garden State Parkway. And he did well. He collected the rent. He found the tenants. The money was okay. I just found that when it came to repairs, and maintenance that since he didn't really have skin in the game, so to speak, I found those expenses increasing. When I say increasing, instead of finding a plumber to fix my water heater, possibly it was always just let's replace it, get a new one. Sometimes he might've been right. It's easier for him to just make the call, get it done. Every plumber just, you know, wants to just put in, take the old one out, put a new one in. It's hard to tinker. It's hard to find handyman. It's easier to find a mechanic, a plumbing a mechanical guy to just install the new boiler uh, right away. But so th that's really the reason why I stopped using management back then. I thought about it with some of the larger multis when I was starting. A lot of the banks required me to have third party local management. And we did sign a, a potential, not an agreement, but a potential. And we submitted that to the bank. We closed on the property. This is about the eight years ago. They started managing the property. Uh, they didn't do great. I reached out to the bank. Can I get rid of them? They said, sure. It's not. I guess maybe after they closed, they were less concerned. And we took over the property, learned a lot managing a property, found good people uh, locally, found a super to live in the building to deal with the 2 a.m. Uh, phone call. And we have good people uh, working for us. That's key. Good people is key. Good partners is very important. When I started on the business, I thought it was just me. I have the special sauce, no reason to get anybody else involved. But as I increased with the larger properties, partnerships are the key. It really is the key. Yeah, exactly. So how do you go about finding good people in your backyard or even better, further out? Because it's even harder when it's not your backyard. Sure. As far as actual vendors and maintenance staff, yeah, that is tough. Sometimes I will reach out to 10 people for a plumbing problem. Three might show up or three will come right away. See how they communicate. See if I feel they're trying to sell me a line of and really settle a numbers guy. So I know that I'll find somebody good if I try 10 people. And it's easy to whittle them out. It's not necessarily all 10 people showing up that I know that. As far as uh, higher level management locally, that does come, a lot of it does come from referrals. In the multifamily space, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of GPs helping other GPs just with knowledge. I'm a, I'm a big networker. I go to a lot of the events and I'm able to find people that come from a referral. And not everyone is great, but if I get four referrals, it's, it's the top of the list. And for the most part, I'm finding good people like that. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And somebody that's been operating like you for so long, I bet you are a better plumber than most plumbers you work with, right? I've changed a few shower heads in the past. Uh, I've definitely adjusted the hot water uh, quite a few times. Uh, when YouTube uh, finally uh, came out and I could Google YouTube that, that made uh, a lot of stuff easier. Yes, but the days of uh, carrying uh, some tools in my uh, car uh, stopped uh, a little while ago. Yeah, no, I'm not a very handy kind of person, right? So if you'll tell me to change a water heater, I'm probably not going to do a good job, but I can tell you step-by-step step how to do it on a commercial size, 1 million BTU water, uh, uh, boiler, no problem. And I can do the lick detection from about 600 miles away. Yeah, that's just the things this business teaches you. Sure. I always say that managing property by yourself is such a learning experience that it's, it's better than a Harvard education. Even if I make mistakes, it's just the value that you get out of some of the stuff that you come across is really tremendous. Yeah, it's crazy how this business teaches you something new every single day. Just every single day. And, and it's mostly because everybody thinks we're in the buildings business, but in reality, we're in the people business. And it's kind of, and humans will always find a way to surprise you. It's, it's just, there's always a way to surprise you. And I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and said, yeah, you can't believe it. I had somebody drive into the building with their car and said, I wish I could tell you that hap that didn't happen to me. And I wish I could tell you it didn't happen to me more than once. But yeah, things like this happen. And that teaches you a lot. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. So what's your larger, largest property, single property? We have 125 units uh, property. You're talking about a price or... Uh, no. Just units. 125 units is our highest one property. Yeah. But yeah, that, um, you know, mostly, yeah, mostly are uh, similar. And I do have a, still a bunch of smaller assets in my backyard in New Jersey. Yeah. You'll get rid of them at some point. Yeah. I, I started selling some here and there. I'll tell you, it bothers me to sell, even though I'm using the money for something good. I'm not pulling my chips from the table. I'm putting them back into deals. A lot of 1031s. Even if it's not a 1031, I'm still using the money well. Every time I drive by two or three years later and I see the property, I know it's worth more. And sometimes I say to myself, sometimes the hardest part is the purchase, getting it done. So I already have that done. Do I really need to pull the funds from here? I try to get it from somewhere else, but it happens. But when I do buy, when I do buy in my gut, I, it's always a long-term hold. It's always a long-term hold. I'm never flipping. I never go in with the intention to flip. When I started, I was involved in flipping a few contracts, but I got into that after I was already a landlord. It's a lot of work, a lot of taxes, and it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a tougher, I found that tougher, believe it or not. Yeah, no, I'm a big believer in not selling real estate, just like you. And sometimes when you have a property long enough, you've already gotten all your money back and more. So it's infinite returns at some point. But I've learned to adopt a, a benchmark that I think every investor has to adopt. Uh, and that is headaches to returns ratio. And that is my rule for selling real estate. If the headaches to returns ratio becomes too to too high to bear, that's when I sell a property. Um, yes, I, I owned a property in uh, New Jersey. It was on a main road. It was a good, it was a nice multifamily. It did well. But since it was on a main road by a bus stop, I got... Tickets galore, just garbage, lawn, some of the stuff maybe I could have mitigated, but it was just like a magnet for code enforcement. And uh, I sold it. I put it on the market. I sold it, took the chips off the table, uh, put it into a different deal. And again, I still pass by and it's worth a lot more than I uh, sold it for. And the guy I, I sold it to is doing well. And I've actually done other deals with him, but it's hard to, it's hard to drive by old properties that I used to own. I, I don't have regrets. If I chose to sell it because of the headaches to returns ratio, right, then I drive by and I see, oh, they're doing fine. Good for them. They can handle the headache. But I saved myself all that headache for all those years worth every penny that I didn't make. 
You're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. So let's talk a little bit about tenant retention. How do you, because, because you're a long-term hold, it's not a flip. So the goal is not to fill it up and sell it. I'm very much like you. So for us, tenant retention becomes the most profitable thing we can do. If we can renew the tenant, if we can slowly increase the rent and not have to turn it, not have to find a new tenant, not have to take the risk of a new tenant that we don't know, that's more money in our pocket in the long run. We always try to do some kind of activities to tell the tenants we care about you. We want you to be happy. We want you to stay here for many years. So what kind of strategies do you guys have around tenant retention? Some of the easy stuff is making sure all their maintenance requests are dealt with right away. Communication is key uh, for all the tenants. Even if you can't get the repair done right away, the fact that you're communicating with them uh, speaks volumes. Uh, obviously, there's always uh, once in a while a tenant is just and really goes crazy on you uh, three minutes after uh, something goes wrong. When it comes to keeping the tenant and asking them to, to renew the lease and to try to get a, a rent bump, uh, something I've done plenty, one of my partners disagrees with this method, but it's worked and we've done it both ways and we still go back and forth. We'll reach out to the tenant and we'll tell them like this, your rent is, your lease is up in three months. You're a great tenant, always paid on time. We like having you. Some of the expenses went up on the property and we do need to put an increase in on a rent renewal. What do you feel comfortable with? And I'll see if I can get it approved. Now, I found that by asking them, first of all, right away, they could say, oh, I'm not, I don't plan on staying. And right away, I know what's happening three months in advance. A lot of times I found that the number that they come back with is sometimes more than I thought that I would. And sometimes if they come back with a lower number, I'll say, okay, I'll try to get that done. And then perhaps the next day come back and say, I can get it done for this much plus this much more. And I think the back and forth with the tenant, it relieves the sting of the increase, uh, relieves uh, the sting of seeing the, the increase in their mailbox right away, puts a human face uh, on both ends. And with text messaging, it became uh, super easy, super simple, very big into text messaging, all the tenants. We offer that option for anything. They want to come in and pay the rent. They want to find out if the office is opened, text messaging. And we have a few people here that monitor the that text uh, number. And sometimes it's me answering. Sometimes it's uh, somebody in the office answering. Sometimes somebody in the local office answering. But communication is very important to get them in. Sometimes they'll tell you, I'll pay your increase, but I need a new oven. And a new oven for me is easier and cheaper than removing the tenant, fixing it up for three weeks, having to do new paint, etc. A new oven is, is an easy, very easy fix. They get what they want. That's what they're asking. Great. Continue. So communication is key. When it comes to the increases, uh, that's very important. Tenants like to feel safe, uh, cameras all over, signs that security is around. I used to think that having cameras and security maybe deter people thinking, oh, this is a dangerous place. But I think for the most part, especially now, everybody's got... Yeah, it's 2024. Yeah, right. Everyone's got cameras all over, fancy homes, bad homes, ring doorbells, etc. Property is well lit. Uh, sensors uh, in certain areas that the light flashes if somebody's walking, keeping things clean. Common areas, we have people cleaning those. Laundry room, keeping it tidy, making sure all the machines are working, reaching out to the vendor, the laundry vendor, just really making it a good place for them to stay. Again, it's all about retention uh, for some of these tenants and uh, yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah, and, and it's really what it's all about. But I want to reemphasize something you said earlier, and you actually repeated it twice, and that is communication. I can't tell you how many times I had to train our staff to realize that, look, they have a work order, we couldn't make it, or we went there and we're missing a part and we had to order it, or whatever it is. If you communicate with a tenant, they know what's going on. If you don't communicate, they think you just forgot about them or you're neglecting them. So always over communicate rather than under communicate. We used to manage C-class apartment buildings and larger communi communities, 100, 200 units and so on. And sometimes a water heater will go out. 
like in the 70s they built everything under a centralized water heater system or a boiler system and it would go out and the entire property will not have hot water and just the way things are it's always like a saturday at 7 p.m or on new year's eve or on a holiday or whatever it is right and the plumber won't come up and, and or they came out and they, okay you need a new water heater there's nowhere to buy it from so I told all my staff, especially my on-site managers, is if we have a, what I call an incident or a crisis, right? You send a message out to the residents every two hours on the hour. Just even if the update is, we're still working, the, the, the contractor is on site trying to fix this thing, we'll send another update when we have something. Like communication. Over-communicate is better than under-communicating. And these days with text and email and automated software and mass emails, mass text, it really becomes uh, super simple to get it done and correct it. It's so important to give the updates. We're waiting for the contractor to come. The contractor is coming. He's there. He's working on it. Just like you said, over communicate. Yeah, exactly. And of course, we use software management, property management software, so that it's as simple as typing up the message, clicking a button, and then everybody gets it. And the software we use actually tells you, do you want to send it to their email? Do you want to send a text message? Do you want to send both? It's, it's just one button and, and you saw, sent that message everywhere. And right. I also want to talk about the comment with the oven, right? Sometimes it's, I want my carpets cleaned or whatever. As owners, we got to look at it from the perspective of, if I can get, I don't know, a hundred dollar increase in rent. I just use a round number. It could be $25. It doesn't matter. I'm looking at it at a six cap over 12 months. I just increased my property value by over $10,000. So paying two, three, $400 for a carpet clean or a new oven, it's that, which is a write-off, it, it, it's a no-brainer. But a lot of landlord will get stuck on the $400 expense and don't realize that we don't make money. The big money in apartments is not from cash flow and it's not from what's left in the bank at the end of the month. It's from your NOI and what it looks like on a five cap, six cap, whatever your cap rate in your area is. That's where the big money is. Tenant retention and getting that rent increase is more important than one-time expense. Very true, very true. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier that you, you're local in New Jersey, right? And so I, live, I live in Brooklyn, New York, but a half hour drive from New Jersey. When I started living in New York is crazy crazy expensive when i started i was a kid i was living at home i had a job when i say a kid i was 22 20 yeah something like that and there was no way i could buy something where i live i spoke to people being in being in my community i, I hear about real estate all the time i'm in the jewish community in brooklyn so real estate plays a big part of just the conversation everybody wants to be involved in real estate everyone likes real estate you have doctors and lawyers who own real estate. Everybody, we have these rich plumbers and they own tons of real estate. Real estate is just something I found. Every Everybody who was well-to-do owned real estate. And it was something I always wanted to get into. Spoke to an investor that I met from New Jersey. When I say investor, he was a real estate. He owned tons of real estate. And he recommended a few areas for me to look at. And MLS, broker, took me uh, two, three months. I really just wanted to pull the trigger and buy something. And that's how I got to it. It was about a 45 minute drive from where I live, maybe an hour with, with no traffic, Perfect. with traffic. But yes, yeah, so I started in Trenton, New Jersey, purchased some more stuff. Oh, actually, when I purchased my first home, my goal was to buy one and done. I used to watch these, <laughs> even before I bought real estate, I used to watch, if you remember, all these infomercials that were on TV. And I never bought, but the infomercials were like a half hour long. And I used to watch them. And I remember, I don't remember which one, but one said that when you, most people, they buy a house for themselves, they pay it off over 30 years, and when it's time to retire, they can now sell this house and downsize to a condo, et cetera, and have that extra money along with social security and retirement as like a big windfall. And I remember thinking to myself, what if I just bought my neighbor's house? Like I'm a regular guy, I own a house, and I, I also bought my neighbor's house. You fast forward 30 years, I don't have to sell my house. I can now sell my neighbor's house that I bought, that the tenants paid rent for and financed over the 30 years. So still living at home, not married, single. 
I, I figure I'm going to buy the home now, get my retirement started, mm-hmm. and that's it. I own one. And when it's time to retire in 35, whatever years, I can sell this house and I'm good to go. It's better than a 401k. Exactly. And then I'm in real estate. I'm in the game. I'm, I'm a player. I, I, I know what's going on. So yeah, a big learning curve, a, a learning process, just the entire process of buying the first. And after about two, three months of collecting rent, maybe even two months, the numbers just started clicking in my head. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. There's so something I, into this thing. I could lay out another four or 5,000 and maybe I could buy another one. And then why not another? And so that's what I did back then. Uh, financing was much yeah. easier than it is now. We had these stated income loans and all you needed was a pulse and you're getting 105, 105% financing. Yeah, I did a lot like of the good old days of 2005 and six. Correct. I did a lot of seller financing, a lot of seller seconds. And till this day, when I'm buying larger multis, I still try to keep the seller somehow involved in the property. If I'm buying it from a non-institution where it's a group or a mom and pop type of guy, I try to keep him involved, even if it's a small amount. I want his, I want access to him throughout. Vested interest, yes. Correct. Right. And it could be small. I could be buying a $7 million property and they could leave 25 grand in there. But the fact that I have a line to him speaks volumes. And sometimes all I'm asking is for the 25 and they end up keeping in half a million. And I've done other deals with sellers who I met that way. And again, networking key is key. Partnerships are tremendous partners. It's amazing how you can find partners, like-minded individuals and real estate is a, is, is a great game. So the partners really, really work. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you guys now own, own in Cleveland. So what triggered the search? Because I get the an hour away from my backyard. That's easy. That makes sense. But going out to a different state, a different market, how did you pick Cleveland as a market? And why the move to begin with? Okay, I know so- the answer. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but... I was exploring, looking in other places. Other people were doing deals outside of New York. New York's a a tough market and there's a lot of New York money in outside real estate. Texas, Carolinas, obviously Florida, even more so the last four or five, uh, three, four years. I came across this deal in Cleveland. Again, it wasn't, it wasn't a broker. It was networking and the reason why I piqued my interest because I spent time in Cleveland, uh, in a suburb of Cleveland, uh, for parts of high school. So I was, so I knew the area. Um, I knew exactly where this property was. And when I went to see it, I figured, okay, let me go visit my old stomping ground. Let me take a look at the property and how it pans out. And I remember when I used to travel for school, sometimes I would fly and sometimes I would go on the bus and it was. Uh, eight hours of my disc man back then, and it, it was okay. So when I went out there the first time, I drove. I let, woke up 4 a.m., drove, uh, got there at early afternoon. I saw the property. I was very excited about it because it just looked good. It was on a nice street. It was terribly managed, terribly. Just some hindsight, just some the group that was selling it, they actually bought this as part of a portfolio with other commercial retail types of properties. And they, this was just like a one-off in that portfolio that they bought. And when they bought it, they figured, okay, we'll take it on, no big deal. We're really interested in other stuff. And they really just let it go. Management is obviously way different for a subway franchise than for tenants living in class B, B minus property. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they really just let it go. And not necessarily with the repairs and maintenance, they just didn't, they had nobody. They, they weren't turning units. They weren't finding new tenants. It was just little by little getting more and more or less occupied. So I, I, I felt that the entire value add strategy, which I was looking for, was simply and really just being aggressive with management. And I, until this day, when people ask me what kind of value add uh, I'm into, it's really just aggressive management. I like to buy properties off long-term owners, typically. I find there's more meat on the bone. They're more available to speak to. They could work a deal. They can get involved. They're nimble. And they leave meat on the bone. They, they're in it for much less. They're fine with where they are. 
they're not pushing the rents. They're in it. Uh, they owe two million on it, and they're selling it for nine million. Mm-hmm. They're fine with a, a below average market rent for their for their pr- uh, property. So I'm not just coming in there and putting in stainless steel and granite uh, for the value add. I'm really just taking existing tenants, existing property, and just being aggressive with the management. And my price point is obviously a lot higher than where this guy's selling it. And I got to make it work. So that's what I'm doing. I'm making sure the tenants, all the month to month tenants, they're getting notices right away about, please sign a lease. I can give you this rent. If you stay, if you want to keep a month to month, the rent will be this much. And I did a lot of that. Um, and I fast forward, it's cash flowing nicely. Awesome. So it's really because you already knew the market from your school days. That's why you ended up there. I, I want to say I knew the market. I knew the area. But yeah. When I was in school there, I, I wasn't a real estate guy. I was a student who was sneaking out the middle of curfew and going bowling or something. But I felt comfortable when I was there. Like I, I knew. So I figured this might be a, a good place to, to start. And yeah, I started in, in Ohio, Cleveland suburbs for out-of-town real estate. Okay, cool. So if you, let's start with that. It's 2024. The market is going sideways a little bit. Personally, I think there's going to be a lot of hurt coming up to the multifamily world in the next few years, mostly because we're shifting from an environment where rents are going up 5, 10, 20% year over year and costs were flat at 2, 3%. Now it feels like we're in an upside curve here where our costs are going a lot faster and our rents are flat as some markets in the country are even going down. Very few pockets are actually still going up, but nowhere near the rates that were going up in the last 10 years. What is your outlook on where we are in the market? What's your plans going forward? Are you guys still in acquisition mode? I'd love to get your insight, especially sure. as a person that's at two full cycle. <laughs> So I'll tell you, and it's a cliche, but it's always the right time to buy. It's just, it's a, it's the deal that matters during good times and bad times. There's always deals happening. Even during the worst times, there's always deals happening. People can make it work. They get a good deal. It's distressed, a lender workout, however it gets done. There's always deals to be had. So I'm always in acquisition mode. Uh, We purchased something uh, back in June. We're in contract now to purchase something. But I'm not just looking at every listing that comes. These are deals that through networking I'm hearing about. And they usually have some sort of story along with it. Again, one of my biggest stories I need is I want a a landlord that's owned it for 10 years plus. Let me hear about those. Let me hear about a tenant, a landlord that gave up on this market and he's left with one property still in this area and he just wants to get rid of it. That's really what I'm looking at. When I come across a deal and it was purchased two years ago and now it's for sale, I can get a good deal that way, but I feel I need to be extra talented to make a deal work that some other operator, and they could be a good operator, bad operator, that some other operator bought it two years ago and now they're selling it. I find that, again, if there's a lot of meat on the bone from a a tired landlord, an older landlord, or a guy who just wants to get out for whatever reason, I find I could just really simple, value add, raise rents, be aggressive with management, clean up the building, show the tenants you care. I find that method seems to play out better, you know, that way. Gotcha. And are you in any other asset classes other than multifamily or multifamily is your main and only thing? So I focus on multifamily. I do own some retail and office. I do own some mixed use properties. I'm also an LP investor into quite a few deals. But again, really, when it comes to LP investing on my end, obviously, I don't really have involvement in the management. I'm really just vetting the GP, the operators. And I'm putting my money in that way. But for the most part, I focus on residential multifamily. Gotcha. Now, sometimes there could be a mixed use component to it, ground floor, restaurant, et cetera. But for the most part, residential. Okay. So this is a question we ask every guest on the show. If you could go back in time and give young Steven Weinstock that driving, that sits on the bus with his disc man on his way to Cleveland, give him a good advice. What would you tell him? 
Okay. Outside of all buying the Amazon and Apple stock, outside of all that, I would say to myself that I'm happy with how I started in the single family space. I'm happy with that because without that, it wouldn't have got me to larger assets and then to multifamily. I needed that education and that experience of owning multiple, when I say single families, I usually mean one to fours. The first few were singles, Mm -hmm. but after a while I focused on really on the three and fours, but I needed this experience to get me to, to where I am. However, if I could tell myself, find partners, give up some equity. It's, it's not a crime to get a good partner that will help you. It, it's easier to get to four properties with a partner than to sometimes get to two by yourself. And sometimes with the right partner, it, it's really sky's the limit. And partners at first I thought would just be another me. And instead the partners are not me. It's everything that I'm not really doing, everything that I'm not interested in or things I don't really have the head for, or just not my forte. And it took me a while to, to learn the value of partnerships. Find a, a partner that complements your strengths. Basically. Correct. Correct. Yep. That, that is a great advice that we hear often. Another one is get to the commercial side a little bit sooner. Yes, obviously, I would have loved to have started a multifamily earlier. But as they say, I had some limited beliefs and I figured either I just can't do it or it's just not for me. But time time heals all and I'm in it and I'm enjoying it very much. I don't see myself buying smaller assets anymore. Uh, there are some, there, there are positives to it. If you're an owner operator type of guy and you just want everything on your own, it's great to buy. All real estate is good to buy. Don't not buy because of X, Y, and Z. Just, I'm a big believer, buy, you'll learn, buy, you'll make it happen. If you have a half decent head on your shoulders, you buy it right, you get a good loan, you should do well. Time heals a lot of real estate mistakes. Yep. And during, during the good times, you could win in, in a year. And during the bad times, it might take you five years to win. But I always say the first five years of owning real estate is the toughest. If you can get to that five-year mark of owning an asset, you're usually good to go. The first five years is tough. Five to 15 years is you make some money. 15 years plus, 20 years plus, that's where wealth comes in. And yeah, to get to that stage is is great. But when you're a 26-year-old guy who owns some real estate, you're not thinking necessarily about 25 years in advance. There is some serious wisdom that you just dropped here. And and I tell all of my investors, real estate is a 15-plus years game. If you're playing a three- to five-year game, just take the money. $300, $300, flight to Vegas, put it on red, you'll get your answer faster. And Because look, if you bought in 2014 and you sold in 2018, you made a lot of money. That's awesome. But yeah. you could have made the same choice in 2006 and lose your shirt. Correct. The, so the short term in real estate is really gambling because everybody wants to time the market, but nobody really can. You might get lucky and you might not. Everybody's going to have to roll the dice on that. But there's not a single property in the United States that you can show me that is selling today at the same price it was selling 15 years ago. There's Correct. just not a single one. So if you're Correct. playing the 15 plus year game, there's just no way you can lose in real estate. I remember when the market crashed in uh, 2008. <clears throat> I used to say when people ask me about it or my opinion on it, I used to say that the people, the investors that are forced to sell are the guys who end up really taking a bath when uh, a downturn hits. And when I say forced to sell, I'm talking about guys who are investors who buy to rehab to sell, builders who build in order to sell. If you have a long-term outlook, or if you're buying with with an option to rent and and keep it long-term, but if you have a long-term outlook, When 2008 hits, it doesn't really have to hurt. You might not want to sell it that year, but if you could hold on to it for a couple of years, you're good to go. If you have to sell and the pandemic hits, okay, pandemic maybe shut it down for a few months and we we saw some great stuff in real estate after that. But if you have to sell is when the trouble hits. Mm -hmm. So if you're not forced to sell, if you're not a rehabber, 
that's paying 12% uh, interest on, on your hard money loan, plus carrying the property. If you're not a builder, if you're not a flipper, if 2008 comes, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to kill you. Rent, rent still got paid in 2008. Uh, it was still due. If you have Section 8 tenants, they were paying. But if you had to sell, it, it was trouble. And the fixed loans are your friend. There's a market for variable loans. I've been guilty of that as well. But it's a big boy game. And if you want to do a variable loan, just to make sure you know what you're doing. Yep. Be ready for the down downside as well as just taking advantage of the upside. Correct. Correct. You have people who they underwrite it uh, very well and okay, we're getting a floating rate at 6% and we're going to underwrite it just in case it goes to nine. And today they might be at uh, 10 or 11 and have trouble uh, refinancing out into, into a fixed product, especially some of the LTVs that were given with the variable loans. That makes it tougher to exit. If you did a variable loan with a low LTV, you're safer. You can get out of the loan easier. But if you're going to do, you're going to play with variable loans, just make sure you know what you're doing. That's my advice. Yeah. And that's part of what we're seeing and why I mentioned earlier, I think that the next two years are going to be challenging in the multifamily world is I've seen properties on, on CoStar and, and so on, where we can see loan data and you can see properties that are 93% occupied on the watch list. And you go, how does a 93% occupied property go on the watch list? And you dig down a little bit deep and you realize that the DSCR is below 1.25. That's why they're on the watch list. But it's the blame is both ways. It's also because there's a lender over there that gave them a loan to an LTV that would make them below the 1.25 at 93% occupancy. So the yeah. same bank that got them in, into that trouble is the one that puts them on the watch list right now. So it's like I said, it's a big boy scam and you got to make sure you got your big boy pants on. And if you're taking the risk, be ready to pay for it. Correct. We have a, a property where we assumed uh, an existing Freddie Mac loan and it came. We got, we inherited it on, on the watch list. So we knew what we were getting into. Uh, but again, the seller was uh, out to lunch and wasn't managing the property. And uh, the value add uh, was pretty standard in, uh, in what we do. And, and we're doing well with the property. And till this day, Sorry, until recently, it was on the watch list, even with above 90%. So it recently came off the watch list. Thank God for that. <clears throat> but they, didn't, they wouldn't release the reserve money that we put up at closing until it gets to 1.35. We did what it, it took to get it off the watch list, but I guess we're not there yet, if ever, to get to our getting refunded some of the reserves we put up at closing. But the rate was, is great. It's in the fours. It's hard to complain about uh, money that cheap and it's a good asset and we're happy with it. But dealing with Freddie and the Fannie and regulatory is definitely a lot different than single family loans in 2001. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I, I got a feeling I know which lender you're talking about, but we'll talk about that after the show. Steven, I want to thank you for your time and I want to be cautious of your time. If our listeners wants to reach out, maybe invest with you, maybe brainstorm, ask a question, how can they find you? Sure. So my company is Weak Capital. The website is Weak Capital X, the letter X at the end, WeCapitalX.com. On LinkedIn, it's probably the best way to reach me. I go to the website. I'm sure there's a link to my email there. Always looking to speak to people on LinkedIn. They could reach out to me and message me for a phone call, schedule a phone call. That's fine. We could talk about some of the deals we've done, some of the stuff we're looking at. Always looking to help, whether you're a GP, an LP, just a guy who wants to get into single family homes, give me a call. I'd love to chat. Other than that, they could watch this podcast. Awesome. We'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes. Steven, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Awesome. And for you, the listeners, if you could do us a favor and give us a, a rating, I don't, one star, five stars, we don't care. As long as you uh, feel we bring value, uh, we'll, we'll appreciate it. And until the next time, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate it.